Hi, and welcome to the next section on losses and risk minimization. Here we will study the concept of loss functions, which measure pointwise how much a prediction deviates from the observed ground truth. And then we will simply sum up all of these losses for a certain machine learning model over all of our training data, and that will give rise to the so-called risk function. And a risk function puts a quality score next to each element from our hypothesis space um, that encodes how well our um, element from the hypothesis space matches our training data. Which means we can now measure the quality of functions for our training data, and if we can measure stuff, we can optimize stuff, and that will now give rise to this principle of uh, empirical risk minimization and uh, at the end we'll hopefully understand that in a certain sense machine learning is not much more than numerical parameter optimization. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. When we want to train a learning algorithm, we optimize over our hypothesis space to find a function which matches our training data best. So that means we're looking for a function where the predicted output per training point is as close as possible to our observed ground truth label. So here, for example, we have, um, I don't know, three observations. We have three um, ground truth labels. And for a given model from our hypothesis space, we also would have three predictions, one per observation each. And now, obviously, we want these guys here on the right-hand side to be as close as possible to these ground truth labels here on the left-hand side. And to make this mathematically precise, we now have to define how we measure here these differences point-wise. And we'll do that by introducing the so-called loss function. So the loss function is nothing diff difficult. It's just a two-argument function where we plug the ground truth label into the first argument, and then we plug the vector of predictions into the um, second argument, and we just write down in a mathematical precise manner how we now measure this difference. So um, in regression we could for example use this absolute loss function here which is the absolute difference between y and um, y hat or we could also use this L2 loss, this quadratic difference, um, it's also possible too and we'll study the details of these loss functions and their differences um, in much more detail later. So here I just want to introduce them as possible examples so you have a certain understanding of what we might use in yeah, concrete algorithms. Now, if we have that loss function, it's pretty easy to theoretically generalize that to a measure of uh, risk for um, an arbitrary hypothesis over our data generating process. So the obvious thing is now to generalize this pointwise loss function uh, to expected loss for our um, function f here. So that means we just compute for any given f. Yeah? We compute the expectation of the loss if we uh, integrate out over our random variables x and y. So if we integrate out with respect to this joint distribution capital P. So this is just the average error we incur if we use a certain given f on training data sampled from capital P. And now the natural goal in machine learning is find a hypothesis that minimizes this risk because that um, hypothesis will minimize expected loss. Okay, And that seems um, to be a smart thing and an appropriate and reasonable thing to do. Problem is we can't do that in practice. That's not really feasible because as I've said before, capital P, this data generating process, is unknown. Now, we have only samples available from it, but we don't know its functional form or we don't know its distribution class, right? Because if we would, we could really use it in a smart manner to construct optimal predictions from it. Um, now, if you have studied density estimation before, you could say, hey, maybe I could just estimate this capital P in a non, even in a non-parametric fashion, um, from my training data D, maybe by kernel density estimation. But this really does not scale very well to higher dimensions. Um, we'll study this later in the curse of dimensionality. And um, in a certain sense, estimating 
the complete distribution capital P is much harder than only trying to optimize um, the predictive model F. Uh, so supervised learning is an easier task than um, yeah, non-parametric density estimation in high dimensional spaces. So going this route here is um, theoretically possible, but in practice, usually not a smart thing to do. What we could do instead is we can place some rigorous assumptions on this um, 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 data generating distribution capital P. Um, so we can, for example, um, assume that, a distribution, that its distributional form is in some, some variant of a Gaussian, for example, and methods like discriminant analysis work exactly this way. So if you're okay with um, yeah, placing these distributional assumptions um, on P and uh, yeah, on your data generating process, and if you're reasonably sure that this is a smart assumption, an appropriate assumption, um, you can proceed in that manner, but we want to study here um, an alternative route, which is much more common in machine learning. And the whole trick just builds on the fact that we might not have capital P available to us, but we have NIID data points sampled from capital P available. So we can now simply approximate this expected risk here by doing the usual trick and replacing this integral here with a finite sum over our data set D. So we just write down this here and we'll now call that not the theoretical risk, but the empirical risk. So this empirical risk evaluates now how well any given function f from our hypothesis space matches our training data because we are simply summing up all of uh, f's pointwise losses over the complete training data set. And this guy here we will from now on call the empirical risk function. And it allows us to associate one quality score with each of our models so it puts a number next to every element from the hypothesis space so that encodes how well our model fits our training data. And so that's now a mapping from capital RH to a score from R. And if we have that, we can now compare, for example, two given models, for example, this guy here and this guy here. And for that simple situation with one feature, we can just compare them by eyeballing. But in general, we can't do that, right? Usually we'll have, I don't know, a few hundred features and it's very, very hard now to visualize these two guys. Um, instead, we can compute their numerical um, empirical risk and just compare them by looking at these numbers. And these numbers will tell us that this guy here on the left-hand side um, has a risk, so a summed loss of um, about 58, and this guy here has a risk close to 100. So we would also, by this quantitative comparison prefer this guy here um, over this guy. And okay, some, some um, extra remarks on that, pretty trivial ones. So first of all, I could also define this risk now not as a summed loss, but an average loss. And if I really uh, wanted to do that and also make that explicit in notation, I'll call that R bar. And to be completely honest, this um, R bar here is um, kind of the correct approximation to that expectation here. But if I only want to optimize this guy for the best model F, I really don't care about this factor here, one divided by N, so I can just be lazy and simplify that um, to this sum form instead of that average form. And I usually do that most of the time here. And the other pretty um, yeah, simple insight, we've talked about this before, is that instead of reasoning about our model F, we'd usually like to kind of rather reason over the parameter vector theta of F. Uh, so we could also define our empirical risk function as a mapping which goes from R to the D, so from an arbitrary parameter vector to our risk score. Uh, and this is usually what we will operate on um, by um, empirical risk minimization. Um, which is exactly what comes next. So if we are looking for the best model with the smallest risk, and if we would have only a finite amount of models available to us, or maybe even a small number, 
we could simply tabulate them, right? We can write them all down, we can write down their parameterizations. So here for this example, I'm again using this uh, simple situation here where I have like, where I have some linear functions um, defined by an intercept and defined by a slope. And I've actually also tabulated these two guys here in this, uh, in this table. You should see them here and here. I've also um, taken two other parameterizations. And here in this last column, I've simply tabulated the empirical risk of these four guys. And now again, by simple eyeballing of the table, you can figure out easily that this here is our best model. So from these four, we pick that one. But of course, usually our hypothesis space is infinitely large. It's also infinitely large for this simple example of linear regression with one intercept and one slope. Yeah? I have an infinite amount of guys for this and an infinite amount of guys for this here. So this, I mean, this, the parameter spaces are to the two, right? So instead of, I don't know, tabulating everything in a naive manner, I can now uh, simply consider the risk surface with respect to my parameter vector theta. And with risk surface, I basically mean just the visualization uh, of this R function here. So this is nothing new. I'm just kind of uh, plotting this now here. Um, and... I can now think about optimizing this for the best perimeter point on that surface here with minimal risk. And usually um, I'll just proceed by numerical optimization. So by some numerical algorithm, I'll probably walk down this error surface here. Most of you guys will have heard um, of, um, for example, gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. And that's exactly what I might do in practice. Walk down this error surface to this optimal point and just use that as my returned optimal parameter vector theta hat. So this is, in a certain sense, what machine learning is all about. It's just taking a certain hypothesis space, defining a loss function that measures errors, um, and then picking a numerical, an appropriate numerical optimization algorithm that helps you to optimize the surface here and to find this optimal parameter vector, return that. These are your learned parameters, and you're kind of done now with learning. So in a certain sense, we've now reduced the problem of learning merely to a problem of numerical parameter optimization.